Scarlett here. Just want to say what's up to everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, today, I'm going to teach you guys about a synastry chart, which is a love compatibility chart. Uh, I think that this is, people will go to astrologers and tarot readers for love, advice, maybe more than any other thing, um, because we are never going to tell you, I just want to make this clear, I'm never going to say you should break up with someone or you should marry someone or anything like that. I want you to take the information that I see through spirit, like whatever symbols that spirit decides to communicate to me, I will tell to you and you interpret it how you wish. Um, I will tell you if I see compatibility, where I see problems, but I will never be like, you definitely need to leave this person. Please do not put that on me, Ricky Bobby, okay? But if you look at a snapshot of the sky the second you're born, um, that is sort of a map slash clock of superimposed of your personality. And if I take your birth chart and superimpose it upon someone else's birth chart, that's called a synastry chart. And so I'll give you one for example that I'll do that I think um, if someone requested for me. Uh, this is, I hope will help you guys um, take it or leave it. So here's what I'll show you, like over here, um, is these two people, I will not say their names, but we're gonna talk about what I see in their synastry of their two charts superimposed. So let's get to it. Um, usually I'm looking at just the circle chart with the glyphs themselves, which is in and of itself a language. Um, I don't know how to explain that. I have been reading runes. I am, my bloodline is um, Celtic. And so I read runes since the age of six. Um, and those are just, um, very primitive almost, an alphabet that um, almost looks like dominoes. I would shuffle them in a bag. But what you learn to do is see a symbol and then interpret the iconography intuitively. So that's what I do. These are my notes. Okay, <laughs> so this is um, like how I read and I take notes like this. And um, I'm looking at glyphs, which mean a lot to me. So uh, here we go. We're going to look at these two people. Um, the first thing I see, okay, when I'm looking at charts, what I see, I see something different in everyone's charts. What, what I notice in one person's chart is not the same thing that I notice in another person's chart. You are all very unique and individual. What I see first off the bat in this thing is um, the stellium of the inside circle, which is in this case gonna be the man that we're talking about here. Um, and what is a stellium? A stellium is when you have quite a few planets glumped together in one house. So as you can see, much like my clock over here, do you see any kind of parallel? Um, so, the, uh, not all of the planets are always clustered, but in this instance, I see a cluster or stellium in the first house. This stellium in particular is Scorpio energy, big. So, um, it's in the first house, so each house has different characteristics or energies. It's almost like they're playing, the planets are playing musical chairs within the houses. Is that a good analogy? So first house is Aries energy. And so it's like the constellation of Aries takes on that energy of the first house. So in this instance, I see the stellium in the first house, which is very Aries energy. That is yourself. Like this person is very self-motivated, self-driven. Um, Aries energy is very fire and quick fire. Like, uh, it's like, think about a horse race, boom, out of the gate, like hard and fast, like fire fast. It's like a firework. 
uh, first house energy is where your soul enters this realm um, on this plane. And so the first house is very much about yourself. And Aries energy is much that way. So I see this person with his son, the Uranus, the Ascendant, the Mars, the Mercury, and the Node. <laughs> All in the first house, all in Scorpio. Uh, what this tells me is that this person is a very sexual being and is very, I'm not gonna call him selfish because that he's not at all selfish, I do know this person, but very much focused on his own needs. He's definitely not selfish, but he, um, first house energy is the self. And so he really doesn't necessarily, we'll get into this in a second, want to always commit because he is trying to focus on his own needs in a relationship, okay? And then his needs are those of a sexual nature because they are so Scorpio and he has so many houses, so many planets going on here. Um, Scorpio energy is very misunderstood often. I myself have very many planets placed in Scorpio. Um, each planet has a different characteristic. So for example, <laughs> this person and I both have our Mercury in Scorpio. Um, and he's a good friend of mine. And so we don't fight with each other. Uh, but like we have both confided in each other that in our personal relationships, we are hot headed. <laughs> and this person also has red hair. So good luck if you have a Mercury um, in Scorpio and you have red hair, have fun with those people because we are a delight. I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> but like, um, what does that mean? So think about an arachnid, that's Scorpio. And uh, these are your spiders, your scorpions. They have venom, they're venomous. I have a tongue that is sharp and venomous. And I know this person does too, right? And my Mercury is actually in a different house, but uh, regardless, this, you know, your Mercury is your communication, your Scorpio is your arachnid. So if you have somebody that communicates like a scorpion and their tongue will stab you like with venom, I'll like, and I don't even have to yell you know, and um, so feistiness, you I see some <laughs> verbal feistiness going on with the Mercury in Scorpio. Um, also his Mars <laughs> is in Scorpio. Um, Mars, that's the god of war. Uh, this is also sex. Mars is sex more so than Venus. Venus is partnership and love, um, but Mars is very uh, fire, sex, go, um, and it is fighting as well. So it's like passion, you know, um, and this person it has his also, not only the Mercury, but the Mars in Scorpio. So what does that mean? <laughs> sexual, sexual. Um, and possessive, you know, in ways. Um, a Scorpio, think about a spider. They'll have a web and they want to possess you in their web, almost like trap you in a cocoon, sort of, <laughs> like possess you. Um, Scorpio, like I have very many Scorpio placements and I am not a jealous person. I don't think this person is a jealous person necessarily. That's why I think Scorpio can be misunderstood. It doesn't necessarily, possession, possessiveness, like I'm not jealous of the things that if those, you know, possession and possessiveness and jealousy are not necessarily the same. And um, Scorpios tend to be more possessive than anything else. They're not jealous, but you they're very hard to read. Scorpio is a water sign. I think people might think it's fire sometimes. You get confused because it feels fiery, but it's the fire of water. Uh, that's a complex idea, so we won't get into that. But it, 
each element has different combinations of elements, but the fire, the Scorpio is water, not fire. These people feel deeply with sex, but so this person in particular with his Mars in Scorpio in the first house is very sexual, very sexual. He's, that's around his, also his ascendant. <laughs> so the thing on the outside, and he is very sexually appealing. And then also the Uranus, which is like sudden changes. So he might have, you know, sudden relationship or sex, sexual kind of like dramatic shifts with this person that he's with sexually. And then also his son is in Scorpio, um, which is, you know, what his conscious thoughts are about, what his daily life revolves around sort of, and then son and um, all of these things in the first house, as well as the node or the Rahu, which is what you're sort of trying to karmically work out. <laughs> so this is a crazy stellium that I see right here. Um, and this just tells me a lot about this person as being a sexually driven person. Um, and that it means a lot to him. That's almost going to be his form of communication. That's going to be what people see in him as well. Um, he might be like, and he sort of is, uh, I guess, uh, you know, sort of like a sex icon or whatever. Like, <laughs> you know, I know that he has some fans and things. Like, he's very um, sexually charismatic. And so people are drawn to him sexually um, for all of these reasons. Now. Those planets, all of his first house stellium is directly in opposition to uh, what's going on with her, with her Chiron in the eighth house, um, conjunct Mars and Jupiter. So what does this mean to me? Um, and then also her Mars is in Taurus. Uh, so Chiron. Chiron is the wounded healer. I will do an entire video about him later, but Chiron, uh, um, this is going to be a source of unresolved pain and trauma. Um, and then the eighth house is Scorpio energy again, which represents sex. So all his Scorpio energy in his first house with his Scorpio is directly opposition to her. Eighth house, Chiron, conjunct Mars and Jupiter, um, right here. And so what is that? So we've talked about him. Let's talk about her. Her Mars is going to be in Taurus. And so she is very, um, needs romance, needs stability, doesn't want change, doesn't want, um, she needs her material needs met. She's going to want romance. She's going to want flowers. She's going to want, you know, food. She might have like a food fetish. I don't know. Um, sexually, you know, I think a Mars Taurus would be into sort of like eating whipped cream off your body sort of things. I don't know because Taurus is very much like the throat energy of, uh, food and like, physical needs. Like I need food to live. I need my house here and they don't like change. Um, and they want to move slowly, which is in opposition to this person whose first house energy is fast. And I know for a fact, cause with this person, I have been on the road with him through three States and this person has a need, a need for speed. <laughs> I'm telling you, he has more speeding tickets than anyone I've ever met. Honest to God, you catch him at a four-way stop and, um, you know, you're on your own. I don't know. Like, fast, fast, fast. That's what this person is, the man. And then the woman, her Mars or her sex, sex drive is more, she needs physical touch. And she's going to move slowly. She doesn't want a bunch of change. Um, and so I see that going on now her Chiron also is in the eighth house, which has to do with sex. And this is where I see 
some people that have sexual trauma from childhood especially this will be a wound that has festers and you feel like it can't heal but then once you do figure out how to deal with it you can help heal others in this area uh chiron uh, it's a elliptical orbit i'll talk about that in my chiron video but chiron uh, it's important to look at what house it's in and her chiron's in the eighth house of sex and then also the jupiter right there so eighth house of sex is where her chiron is her mars is sex right there and then the jupiter is the planet of expansion which makes all of this stuff exacerbated so her, this person is very sexual also but <clears throat> in a different way the man is very sexually driven and it's all about him and you know the uh, you know this one I'm, the planets are telling me i don't know their particular relationship but then her sexual energy is a little more wounded <clears throat> and so they're also both of their chirons are on top of each other so his wound in this instance his chiron i can't remember what house sixth house his Chiron's in the sixth house, which is like Virgo energy of perfectionism. So like he's maybe always trying to fix her wound and her wound exacerbates and they have to learn how to balance. I'm not going to say they're necessarily incompatible. They're just very sexual with one another and they need to learn to see that these two phenomenon are occurring so that they can um, accept that about each other. Does that make sense? Okay. And so that's their sex. His Mars, we talked about, is in Scorpio. Her Mars is in Taurus. That's not necessarily incompatible. Let's talk about Venus. Venus is the love and partnership. That's more partnership. <laughs> so let's talk about her first. Um, her Venus is in Leo. So in a romantic relationship she will be more selfish in the partnership area um where he might be more selfish sexually she might be more selfish romantically and so she wants to be doted upon um you know leo's the lion but they do tend to revolve around themselves and so romantically with a venus leo um, they're most in love with themselves or in love with the idea of someone loving them. Does that make sense? Like they are in love with the fact that people love them. It's all mostly their relationships are attached to their ego with a Venus Leo. Okay. And then his Venus is Sagittarius. And so Sagittarius is fun energy but um i love sagittarius this is my moon my best friend sag I love sag sag is the archer they're always on the hunt and they're a very fire sign and so his venus is his relationships or his love or his partnership he wants to be always moving and on the hunt which is um sort of in not agreement with some of her Taurus energy and then also the moon that she has in Taurus. We'll talk about it in a minute, but Sagittarius Venus will want to um, always be looking for, he's always going to be sort of having his arrow pointed somewhere else. That's Sagittarius. I mean, look, I love a Sagittarius. I have Sagittarius in my moon. Um, I know many Sagittarii. <laughs> and we're hunters all right like hunt and so <clears throat> that's his venus okay <laughs> so he's got a lot of that going on now let's talk about the moon so the moon is what i'm looking at especially in this industry chart um the moon i think is the most important compatibility like you can't just look at like a libra and a uh, Virgo are incompatible because they're suns. You really need to look at all the planets, especially 
the Venus, Mars, and most importantly, the moon, if you ask me. So the moon is really what drives both of you. It's like what you have in common. Like it's the thing that connects you subconsciously. Uh, so this, let's talk about her moon is in Taurus. So she's going to want comfort. Like I said earlier about Taurus energy, they are stubborn. They just are. And so they may not want to budge. Like if someone else wants to change, they may not, they resist change and they will be stubborn about it and not want to budge on their, uh, what motivates them if it's the moon. Um, so they're slow, but they're loyal. You know, they're very romantic. They want comfort. They want their needs met and, um, they want reliability. So that's her moon. His moon is in Gemini. And Gemini is like the opposite of slow. Uh, Gemini is fast, 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 quick witted. Um, a Gemini moon, they'll be actors. I see actors, directors, writers a lot artists a gemini moon is very intellectual they're intellectually stimulated again whereas the woman in this instance is like physically material stimulated the man in this instance will be more intellectually driven wants to have like uh sagittarius energy which uh his uh sagittarius energy that he's got is um very much philosophical and so the Gemini will be like, he likes to talk, you know, um, and I see a Gemini, Gemini moons are very loquacious and they do love to use words, which makes them good writers often. So, and this person is a writer, he's a songwriter. So, uh, a Gemini moon's good at writing, uh, good with words, good with thoughts. Their thoughts are going a hundred miles an hour. Um, a Taurus is a little more slow moving. Um, the Gemini is attracted to the stability of the Taurus, though. So, so the he likes that about the Taurus, the opposition. Um, the Taurus might get a little annoyed with the Gemini energy, however, but she might also need that to balance how earthy she is because the Taurus is earth and Gemini is air. And so that, if you look, again, if these two people could learn to balance these situations, then they may be able to work it out, right? So like, I'm not gonna tell you, well, air and um, earth are not compatible. Well, maybe they balance, do you know what I mean? Like Paula Abdul said, opposites attract, um, but it's a matter of making it harmonious, right? Uh, what else do I see here? Both, um, their Plutos are conjunct in Libra, so deep down they have this desire for partnership, but it's sort of like suppressed. And then also their Neptunes are conjunct in Sag. So um, they're always, both of them sort of subconsciously dreaming about hunting for someone else. <laughs> is what I see there. I don't know. Um... And I guess that's all I'm gonna say about these two people. Um, they just need to learn how to balance their energy and stop trying to make the other person be something they're not. So if the Taurus energy expects all the Scorpio energy um, and the Gemini energy, like if these two people expect different things from each other than what they're capable of, that's when a problem arises. So this is why I think astrology synastry is helpful because then you can understand yourself and your partner. Stop trying to necessarily change them. Like, can you accept these things about the other person? Do you want to live with these traits or do you want to hit the road, Jack? You know, that's up to you. That's not something I'm going to tell you. You have to decide uh, what works for you. And so even, you know, if I see like a like a Mars placement that 
shows that these people are going to fight. I don't see that here. But like if I see that sometimes like, well, maybe sometimes people enjoy that to fight. I'm not going to tell you what's right for your world, you know. Um, but you need to figure out for yourself what you want in a person. Um, and then if you see certain things in someone's chart that you don't want to live with for the rest of your life, then just address it. Um, but stop trying to change someone or make them something they're not. Just maybe learn to look at astrology as a tool in order to help you understand yourself and those you love and how to better interact with those people in your life. We all have people, whether it's a husband, wife, mother, father, sister, brother, um, that you clash with or you get along with. Um, and maybe astrology can explain some of the reasons why. And um, so I hope you enjoyed my video. If you got something out of it, if you didn't, but uh, please leave me comments if you have any questions. Um, and please like and subscribe and tell me what you think. And if you want me to do your sinistry chart, um, I'd be happy to help you too. So peace out, Vogue. See you next time.